with El Nino coming back, it's it's going to be a very, very hot summer. And with all the things that go with that, extreme temperatures, lots and lots of nasty things, we'll have to kind of endure that and see just, well, just what can we endure if you have an El Nino and it, it gets up to record temperatures, which you could easily do, then where do you go from there? Does the record get broken every year until the world is unfit for human habitation or what? Welcome to Facing Future. Today's guest is Peter Wadhams, Professor Emeritus, Cambridge University, and the author of A Farewell to Ice. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. It's good to be here. Italy, sandwiched between the rapidly warming Adriatic and Mediterranean seas, is particularly vulnerable to climate change. Last year, severe drought drained many of Italy's rivers and dried up 45% of its farmland. This year, it's flooding. Parts of northern Italy received half of their average rainfall in just 36 hours. Rivers burst their banks, submerging thousands of acres of farmland. Peter, who lives in Turin with his wife, Maria Pia Casarini, is witnessing the effects of these crises firsthand. Peter, looks like the climate dragon is at the doorstep of Europe. What are you seeing? Well, where I am, um, the, the the city of Turin hasn't been flooded, but the river Po, which is the longest river in Italy, has dried up over the past year until, of course, the latest inundation. But with it being dried up, there was nothing much in the way of water in it anymore. And um, the cropland was being starved of water. It was, uh, it was a fairly disastrous state. Then, of course, a bigger disaster happened. The reason was that the Po and all the 21 other rivers that have recently burst their banks, they'd all dried up to the point where the riverbed was like a kind of cracked clay pot that, that completely dried. And it meant that when it did rain, the water had nowhere to go. It couldn't run away because it was trapped in this giant pot. So the river levels and water levels just rose incredibly rapidly. In a day, they went up about uh, a metre. Just and then it continued as it continued to rain, the water level just kept going up because it couldn't go anywhere. And the cause of the the fact that it was such a big disaster was a lot of starvation of water followed by an inundation of water. And uh, that's a classic case, really, of an extreme weather event because the amount of rain that fell uh, was much more than you would normally get. So it was really, I think we can class it with these extreme weather events where something awful happens beyond the normal limits. So the river was dried up. Therefore, normally when it rained, it would drain through the surface of the river at the bottom. Yeah. But because it was so hard and clay-like, it couldn't do that? Is that what happened? Yes, it is. We can see that, that that's happened and it's still happening because the floods haven't gone away. We still see regularly nightly news. The water level is nearly the same as it was when the floods happened. The water's got nowhere to go. And so we've got a long flooding situation. So this is particularly worrisome in terms of, well, towns um, life lost, uh, property lost, but also in terms of agriculture and the ability to um, to grow things. Um, I understand rice is a you know risotto, Italian risotto um, is a particularly sensitive crop that it either is dried out because of course it needs water to grow, or what's happening with it now? Is it is it underwater? Is it gone? Well, it, it's it's underwater, but it can survive underwater. Um, that's what it's like when you plant it. Uh, but the, the biggest damage has been to vegetables and fruit. So uh, the, the market, that's the uh, area, this area uh, was the, the, the biggest fruit growing area in Italy, in fact, in Europe, I think, uh, with peaches and, 
uh, all, all those nice um, things. And they've just been destroyed. Whole fields of fruit and vegetables have, have just gone. So it's been incredibly damaging to agriculture. It's caused, well, 15 deaths, which is actually quite good because they've got a very good mm. water system in place. Mm -hmm. in it. The other thing that's been happening, of course, is a lot of, because it, Italy is a kind of art centre of the world, there's been lots and lots of damage, but it hasn't even been assessed yet. People have been too busy trying to rescue uh, rescue other people and and uh, try to do some flooding, but it's um, things like basements of abbeys has been one of the worst hits because that's where they keep their their libraries and their libraries are full of ancient manuscripts. You just see horrible pictures of the ancient manuscripts lying around, soaked in mud. So it's going to be mm. awful to see how that's going to be made good. Well, you know, we think of art, you think of, you know, Florence, Venice, particularly. I, and I wonder what, what will happen with Venice already. <laughs> it's already used to having water in its streets, but is that going to be very disastrous and soon? Well, it is already. Um, I mean, these particular floods hit Ravenna as the most precious art city that was, mm. was this time around. But uh, Venice... There's a lot of worry because they spent several years, in fact, about 20 years, building wonderful things called the gates, which is closed when the high water comes along and prevents the city from flooding. But of course, because it took 20 years, that gave ample opportunity for corruption to do its work. So this system doesn't work very well. And uh, when it's been used or attempted to be used, it really doesn't do the job and so there's a lot of worry now that, that Venice is going to be lost because the wonderful piece of geotechnology is uh -huh. not doing its job. They have that in London too, they they worked out on the River Thames some kind of gates that they that were working but probably won't work in the future and New York has talked about doing that as well but I, I believe the UN uh, IPCC report or, or is saying that, you know, this really isn't going to be the best, this isn't going to work, these gates. I, I don't know. What do you think? Well, I know the London ones pretty well because they're not that far from my childhood home. And uh, they do work. They will cover quite a large range of sea level rise. In fact, they've calculated that they will cover 5.2 metres. But I think you only get 5.2 meters if you add on some height to the to the gates. But it is in principle a way of dealing with flooding in central London. But the trouble is that means everywhere else gets worse. So when they close the gates, it's closing the gate on flooding coming into London from the eastern part of the Thames. The trouble is that means it reflects the water back into the eastern part of the Thames, which happens to be <laughs> where I grew up. <laughs> so all those little towns and suburbs and so on that, that are along, along the banks of the Thames will get completely flooded out so that central London, with where, of course, the politicians live, uh, can be preserved. Uh -huh. Sounds very English, the, <laughs> with their royalty and their upper class. And, you know, it's terrifying how unequal our societies are. Yes, um, certainly British society is. Certainly British society, yes, indeed. Okay, so there's a drought and then there's a flood. It would seem that when there's a flood, it, catchment basins everywhere would make sense? Yes, I'm sure that there could be things done. Um, but they haven't been. I mean, that's one of the complaints in Italy is how did we get this way when we had lots of things we could have been doing? Um, and that's, that's, in fact, hopefully going to produce some action. But at the moment, it hasn't. Yeah, well, 
you know, I was reading that people are actually attacking meteorologists online and et cetera um, because of the weather. You're causing the weather or you're making it look worse than it is or whatever. And it's like ridiculous. People just won't come to recognize the, the facts of what's happening, even when their streets are flooded. Uh, somebody, you know, it couldn't be climate change, couldn't be you know, our use of fossil fuels, whatever. You know, it must be because meteorologists are making it up. It's not yes, it's, you have to blame somebody. And, uh, uh, why not blame meteorologists? In fact, of course, <laughs> there are some quite good reasons to blame meteorologists for um, for the uh, the bad approach that they have to modelling. I mean, you, you find some of the the great people in the world, like Jim Hansen, have expressed um, in violent contempt for climate modellers who who simply turn the handle and on, on models and and predict uh, things which which don't bear any relation to reality so they sort of say well climate modeling is useless and we, we shouldn't be doing it we should be studying data instead and uh, i would tend to mm -hmm. agree with that <laughs> well don't they feed the data into the climate modeling program well yes in theory yes but um, <laughs> There are many climate modelers, and when you read climate modeling papers, they sort of say, we test this model by comparing the results with another model. And you know, there's, there's, in the end, it's all models. And uh, yeah. when you get a really severe actual event, everybody's left wondering what's going on. Well, you know, the prediction of weather is, is now really difficult. Um, you know, we used to have these 10 year storms, 100 year storms, you know, but obviously it, they're coming one upon another upon another. And last year's heat wave in Europe was really terrifying and um, dangerous. And this year we're looking at the El Nino possibility. What do you think is that effect on Europe this summer? Um, yes, I mean, it looks very bad because. Um last year when there was a lot of heat and a lot of uh, problems it was uh, the opposite system in place La Nina, La Nina. Uh, but with with El Nino coming back it's it's going to be a very very hot summer and with all the things that go with that extreme temperatures lots and lots of nasty things we'll have to kind of endure that and see just well, just what can we endure if you have an El Nino and it, it gets up to, to record temperatures, which you could easily do, then where do you go from there? Does the record get broken every year until the world is unfit for human habitation or what? So the heating is probable in the summer. Mm -hmm. We don't know if it's going to be dry or if it's going to be wet. And of course, the wet heat is even more dangerous because of the wet bulb effect. Um, is there any thought about how what, what will happen this summer? Will it be wet or will it be dry? Well, there isn't a consensus on wet or dry, but there is a consensus on heat. And mm -hmm. um, that, that means that if you look at places where already the temperature is uh, unsustainable levels, like India uh, last year, it's going to happen again, only worse. So you know that they're going to suffer more extreme this year. Well, India had a heat wave in April, um, and they were, you know, waiting for the monsoon. <laughs> and that was rather mm. powerful heat wave. It, it, India is one of the, of course, we all read uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's account of uh, what might happen in India with the wet bulb and everybody kind of who's read that has that in back of their mind will this happen well something like it will um last year showed whole regions of india where in theory everybody should have died but of course people didn't somehow they got acclimatized and were able to find ways to keep out of the heat at a certain point that protective effect of being used to it will go away and um well, you know, there's air conditioning in some places and poorer people don't have air conditioning mm. and air conditioning worsens the crisis because it, the heat goes outside and the coolness is inside. And, and so the, in a city, that makes a big difference. Also, the effect of vegetation drying up is really serious because 
it it's immensely cooler in areas where there's trees shading um, and releasing some amount of, of uh, moisture into the air. Well, it does make a huge difference. I was um, in Scotland uh, a couple of weeks ago on a project uh, to look at the effect of uh, planting trees on a river. So this was a, a nice fast flowing Scottish river, super clean. Well, at least it looks super clean, um, with a bare riverbank, which had been washed away by lots of flooding. So we've been planting trees along the riverbank with different species that offer shade. So the idea is to measure how good that is at bringing enough shade to prevent the salmon from dying, the small young salmon, which uh, we want to save from a fate, a fate resembling, <laughs> say fate worse than death, is a fate worth, worse than being fried. Um, so, uh, but it does make a huge difference. And uh, there are lots of things that you can do. Well, along riverbanks, it's particularly important for various uh, species um, that there be vegetation along rivers instead of, say, concrete that comes <laughs> close to the river. We have to think about absorptive uh, areas. But balancing this water, balancing water um, is is the critical, well, that and the heat uh, part of it. And there's a lot that we could do to prepare for those kind of disbalances. The, the dryness is probably more difficult, but the wetness, I mean, in, in, in uh, Holland, they made roof from the river. They moved the houses all the way from the river. And so when the river floods, it doesn't kill people. It doesn't ruin their houses. It, it goes into the parkland, which is absorptive. Um, that should be done everywhere. Yes, they're very enlightened in, in Holland about how how you do that and long experience. Um, of course, in Britain, they're not very enlightened. So there's more, it's more that Britain is full of places where raw sewage is being dumped into rivers. That's, really? Still? Yeah, it's illegal, completely illegal, but yep. they're, they're still doing it. Uh, and the, this is one of the scandal, many scandals of Britain, on account of our really useless government, but <laughs> yeah, as well. <laughs> but the authorities are just dumping raw sewage into into rivers, and I think there's only two beaches now in the whole of the coast of Britain that are fit for swimming that, that doesn't kill you with <laughs> with poison uh, the poison. So so it's a scandal, really, but. There's so many yes. scandals in Britain that, that it's, it's not being noticed or having anything done about it. When I was a child, I, I grew up in Long Island. Uh, the Long, the uh, Great Neck Bay was completely polluted because there was a sewer pipe coming right next to the, the walkway where, you go, where people would launch their boats. And it's, it's like, what? You know, it is, yeah. And when it was low tide, you know, it was really revolting. Uh, and that ended eventually. But I, I just, as a small child, I thought, this isn't fair. This is not nice. I want to swim in there. And it was sort of my first awareness of the environmental crisis that was impacting the world around me, that this horrible pollution it was really like tragic. And I, it's horrifying to see that people are still doing that X number of years later. <laughs> and, you, and you see it because it, there's, there's great big, large diameter pipes full of absolutely filthy liquid, which are pouring it out into the river. The river's been destroyed up and down the country. Well, let's not stay there. Let's talk about glaciers for a moment because your specialty is ice. The glacial melt and the snow melt is, feeds most of the rivers of Europe. What, what is going on with that? Well, the the glacial melt is is going faster than in the past. The question is, is is it going to actually take away um, ice from vital all the vital places? Sea ice obviously is something that it goes, it's gone. But there's also the question of the melt of of glaciers uh, and snowfields where the melt water is depend 
is, is meant to happen every year to produce water for irrigation and to enable a, a cycle of crops to grow. The question is if there isn't any or isn't enough um, water melting in the uh, ice melting in the, the, the year, yearly cycle, there won't be enough water to irrigate the crops that you want to grow. And this is happening all through the Himalayan region, especially mm -hmm. a big worry for farmers of, of, in, in that region of the world and in, in similar regions in uh, South America generally. Right. Well, the Alps in Europe would is is sort of the source, right? And that that also is equally threatened. Uh, yes. Well, well, from from my from my window here, I can see the Alps. At least that's actually a measure of pollution because only on, only on about fifty percent of days do you see the Alps, even though they're only about thirty kilometers away, um, because of the air pollution. And Turin is very famous for air pollution because it has millions of cars. It also has trams, uh, which which have a habit of throwing off dust from the brakes. And uh, it's, it turns out that um, Turin has the highest air pollution levels of any Italian city. And it's not because of the heavy industry or anything like that. It's It's things like um, trams, lorries, cars, and it makes it very, very unhealthy. And it's enough to make it visible. In fact, for the first several weeks that I lived here, I didn't know we were in the middle of the Alps. I thought it was, really? <laughs> I thought it was, wow. it was nice flat countryside all around. It turned out that then gradually some, some icy peaks appeared. Uh, because the the air pollution has gone back. So. Well, the air pollution has that weird effect of uh, forming a, an aerosol that actually cools the climate in certain in places. I understand India would be a degree hotter if it weren't for all the incredible air pollution that that's there. Is that true of Turin as well? I think it probably is. Yes, I'll have to ask my colleagues at the lab. <laughs> sure, it's one of the things that they study. The masking effect, um, one of the, the the only probably benefit we get from our, these horrible pollutants um, is a slight cooling effect. So do you think the glaciers of Europe will disappear? Um, yes. Well, well, it's already happening. And in my lab, we've been studying uh, some places where uh, the glaciers are vanishing. And um, it's kind of frightening. Um there's a, a glacier on the slopes of Mont Blanc called the Plan Pansieur Glacier. It looks as if it shouldn't be there, but it shouldn't. It's stuck to the side of Mont Blanc and it's been coming away in great chunks, really mm -hmm. serious, huge chunks of ice are falling off this glacier. They're rolling down the mountainside and smashing into buildings at the bottom so that the villages around the bottom of that part of Mont Blanc have had to be abandoned because they've been bombarded by, by huge chunks of ice. And in fact, there was the classic one that called the, the Marmalade Glacier, where an enormous area came away and killed a lot of people on, on its way down. It produced a, a kind of an ice avalanche. So there's, there's dramatic things going on and which are being studied intensely. Um, and the end product of it all will be uh, bare mountains with, with the ice gone and um, uh, not kind of boring environment. Well, we live in, a, in strange times in an amazingly changing world and, and nobody quite knows what the landscape of the earth will look like, but we're all sure it's gonna change radically in the next decades. Um, thank you, Peter, so much for <clears throat> this conversation and for being part of our team. Okay.